So um, I've given this talk, not you know this exact talk, but a version of this in a quality uh, discussion uh, with uh, uh, customers. And uh, you know we talk about how things have changed in the cloud cadence and uh, the combined engineering and shift lab. And you know at, at the end of the presentation they say, "Wow, that seems pretty drastic. Uh, uh, I don't, don't know if you are ready to do that." And the reality is that you know our testing approach at Microsoft has been evolving for quite some time. I would say for more than a decade. So before I go into what happened during the cloud cadence, I thought I'll just give you a quick uh, history of what happened before that. Uh, because the customers that you might talk to, they may be at different phases in this transformation. And uh, you know, I won't spend too much time in the history, but hopefully that will give you a sense of uh, uh, how to kind of guide the customers through this in case they are somewhere you know, prior to where the cloud cadence happened in, in BSDS. So you know, I'm going to take you back to 90s. Um, you know, so for uh, as long as Microsoft Shift product, we we always had three <coughs> distinct disciplines in in a product team. You know, PM, Dev, and Test. PMs uh, gather customer requirements, wrote specs. Dev wrote code and design code, and Test uh, wrote test. Uh, roughly, we'd have a one is to one is to 1.5 ratio. It kind of varied by teams, but that's the general ratio we used. Now, within Test, we had two distinct disciplines. Now, many people may not know this. Uh, but this was a unique setup at Microsoft where within test we would have a software design engineering test, these are the SDETs, who developed the automation, uh, the test infrastructure, et cetera, and then software test engineer, or the STEs, who ran the automation or who ran manual test. And this is a key point. Uh, the software design engineering test uh, were hired you know, with a very similar qualification as the software design engineers or the developers. You went to the same colleges, and if you hired from industry, would pretty, pretty much hire developers and then convert them into SDETs. And I'll remember this point when I come and talk about the combined engineering, because this is, this is important, in, in particular the way the test discipline was set up at Microsoft. Um, so how did it work? Well, it worked reasonably well back in the days. Uh, you know, we achieved commercial success with big products like Windows and Windows and Office. Uh, one of the benefits of this model was that when we are ready to do a product sign-off, uh, you will have the quality discipline or the test discipline bring in a very uh, formal uh, sign-off criteria and, and formal measurements in quality. Um, and so that gave us a pretty good confidence in you know declaring a product ready to release. Uh, it also developed uh, deep expertise in testing because the test discipline was solely focused on testing. They were thinking about this day in, day out. So that was the great thing. Uh, but did it really work, though? And the answer is no, it did not work. There were problems. The problems were simply masked by the fact that A, we had commercial success of our big products, and B, we, there was a long product cycle. But there are numerous problems. You know, so the developers just threw the code over to the wall to the uh, testers, SDETs, the SDETs wrote automation and then threw that over wall to the STEs, or the software test engineers. So, and the STEs, the way they responded is by just keep adding more and more STEs, particularly the vendors. Um, there was really no growth opportunity for the, the STEs, because they really didn't have any upward mobility, they couldn't go anywhere. It was very expensive to maintain this, this setup, and testing became bottleneck and caused product delays, but again, we couldn't see some of, we, can, we didn't feel as much because our product cycle was long. We shipped uh, Windows every two years or three years, so this sort of worked. Um, by, by around 2000, late 90s, uh, it became very clear in the company that this wasn't working and we had to change something. So a company-wide decision was made to get rid of the STEs. Uh, from the test discipline, we had SDETs and STEs, so no more STEs, they are gone. And uh, we did that. It was actually very painful because those STs, remember the STs didn't have the same qualification as the SDETs, and so a lot of them, we tried to find them new roles in the company, you know, some of them did, but many, many of them didn't. Um, so this, this sort of improved the model a little bit in the sense that now you have SDETs who are uh, you know, responsible for not only writing automation, but operating the auto automation. So they, they own the whole thing. So they were naturally incentivized to A, write good automation, B, you know, write more automation instead of just throwing uh, test over to the, another team uh, to take care of just running the test. They were now responsible uh, for, 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 for it all. Um, but the core problem still remained. The developers would you know, send, throw the code over to all to the SDETs, SDETs were constantly trying to catch up. Uh, so we got clever, and we said, 
You know what? We're going to introduce a thing called quality milestone or an MQ. Now, this is a milestone we would introduce or we'll you know, have uh, after a product is released and before the next product is uh, about to start. And we'll block off a certain period of time and say, we'll, we'll, you know, whatever the quality debt or test debt we accumulated in the previous release, we'll just catch up and fix it there. A clever idea, but it didn't work. Uh, it, it didn't work in practice, and, you know, for just a couple of reasons. One is that. Now people knew that there was a milestone coming up called quality, so they would just defer the quality over to that milestone. Um, and the other issue is that you have a milestone dedicated to quality, so people would conjure up all kinds of quality initiatives and things that they think is creative inside the quality realm and try to uh, you know, schedule that work, cause priority inversions, and sometimes that work didn't get done and we just accumulated more, more debt. So a clever idea that didn't really work. So the test was still a bottleneck, but we again we survived because we are in this waterfall waterfall world. Um, then came the cloud cadence. So the arrival of the cloud cadence around 20, 2008 uh, time frame, 2010, and it brought new uh, pressure on the system. Now there is expectation that the you know we are running a much fast, faster cycle, and the expectation just continued to increase. You know faster, faster, faster. Uh, we long, you know, the, gone are those long stabilization phases. We don't have the opportunity to create a beta and give it to customers, do dog food, you know. So those kind of validation phases are gone, which are crutches in the past, but they are now gone. Uh, you have, you're living in the world of microservices. These microservices are deployed independently, uh, so there is, you know, pretty much pretty uh, significant complexity in terms of uh, uh, getting those services right, the quality right, uh, on an independent cadence. You know, Buck talked about how we had to support uh, no downtime deployments. Uh, the services need to stay up all the time. Um, and so, so what did we do? Well, we knew how to ship software for the last 25 years. So we said, well, just use the same approach. Just try to do it faster. Uh, you know, we went from two-year cycle to six-month cycle to three-week cycle. And just try to figure out how to do whatever we knew. Just do it faster. So our initial approach was same model, run faster. Um, we pushed for kind of getting automation more streamlined, and we got clever again. And we said, oh, one of the ways we can uh, deal with this is that we don't need to run all the tests. Guess what? You know, we can be very smart about which tests to run. We'll pick some tests here and pick some tests there, and that's how we'll survive. But it was just a matter of survival. Uh, it, it became very clear to us that um, the model wasn't working. And so the, you know, we started seeing all kinds of issues. You know, testing was a ma major bottleneck by this time. Uh, particularly in VSTS, uh, I think uh, Bill or somebody mentioned that we had some sprints where we would do a three-week uh, sprint cycle, uh, we finish that, then we go through another three-week of uh, a stabilization. By the time a, uh, a sprint got deployed, it would take another three weeks, and the assets are running around trying to stabilize the system and deploy it. In the meantime, the, the, the work on the next sprint is already completed, and, and so they're just you know, they're trying to catch up, and, and the cycle would continue. Uh, you know, same issues, lack of accountability on the devs. Uh, the, the short, the short uh, version is that we, we recognized that this model wasn't working. And we, in fact, we were not the first one to recognize it. Uh, uh, there were services before us, like Bing was one of the major services at Microsoft, uh, that, that saw this. And we, we started seeing, observing this, you know, based on the practices, uh, some of the companies born in the cloud, uh, they were following in the industry. So, so we, we, we knew that we, we needed a new model um, in, the, in the cloud cadence. So that's where we, we get to this point. Um, my rest of the talk is about what happened in the cloud cadence. I just want to give you a flavor of what happened before that, because you might run into customers who probably still have the world where you have STEs who are running around uh, writing, uh, running manual tests, and there is not a lot of emphasis on automation. So uh, you have to kind of bring them along on the journey before you kind of uh, talk about some of the other stuff uh, uh, you know, I'll walk you through. Um, so what happened? What happened in the cloud cadence? In, in, you know, this is sort of pretty much sums up uh, the three big things that we changed. We changed uh, the quality ownership. We fixed the quality accountability. So that's number one. The second thing is that we understood that in order to ship frequently out of a release branch, you need to have a master that is also in a pretty good shape. It's in always a shippable state. Uh, you know, you, you, you saw Bill talk about how we work in the master and then the release where we release. 
it's the quality is not just about getting the release branch right. It's it's actually quality you know starts in the master branch and keeping it in a shippable state. Now that you know is a statement about a lot of things, sort of the code flow and you know sort of how the branch mechanics stuff that Bill talked about. Uh, but from testing perspective, we focused on two things. One is this concept of shift left, uh, shift left testing, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then the second thing was uh, eradicating, uh, getting rid of all the test uh, uh, flakiness um, in the system. The other thing that we understood is that there is no place like production. Uh, this, this, is a, uh, this is sort of, I would call this the shift right part of the strategy. So on shift left, you know, run test close to the code, run more unit test. Uh, to me, shift right is you know run test close to production because there is no place like production, uh, and it's a set of practices about uh, sort of both safeguarding the production as well as uh, ensuring quality um, uh, in in production. So we in a, in a sense we got rid of the the testing that was happening in the middle, you know, sort of the your integration style testing, functional testing that used to happen in the lab. Uh, that was the big departure here. All right, so I'm going to walk through each of these concepts in a little bit more detail. Um, quality ownership. So the, we, did, we did combined engineering. You heard this term before. Uh, so, you know, we've talked about this. Combined engineering, in a nutshell, is uh, you know, those two disciplines, dev and test, two roles, taking those two roles and merging them and putting it uh, on a single discipline, single role, called an engineer. So we got rid of the two uh, SD and SDAT roles, just one role, engineer. Um, the key thing is that when we did this, um, that there is, so first of all, there is a, uh, the, that individual has a combined responsibility for both dev and, and test. Uh, so, uh, and it's not, so it's not just an organizational change where you bring the dev and test team together. It's an actual discipline merge. You, you know, if you think about uh, the set of, uh, 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 qualification or requirements of SDE and set of qualification requirement for SDTs, you merge them into a single set, that's, that's what this was. Um, and so everyone had to learn new skills. A lot of times when I talk about this, the first question I get is, so what happened to those SDETs? Did they learn how to write code? Well, the reality is that, you know, remember the qualification I mentioned earlier, they knew how to write code. They, were, they had gotten a little bit rusty in terms of their design skills. But this was also a learning for the, for the developers, because developers now have to learn how to write test, write automation, run test, you know, do manual testing, do exploratory testing, you know, things like that. So this required learning on both sides, and that's, I think that's a key point. When a lot of times people talk about combined engineering, they say, oh, okay, that means I need to train my testers to be more like devs. No, 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 it actually goes both ways. Um, the other key concept here was that we, you know, the idea behind this is that you want to reduce handoffs. There is no, you know, in a short cadence, you don't have the opportunity to start somewhere, you know, write your code, give it to another team to test, and then give it to maybe another team to do performance testing, and give it to another team to do deployments. The basic idea was that we wanted to reduce handoffs in the, in the team, uh, and give an end-to-end -end accountability uh, to a feature team, to, a, to an engineer inside a feature team. Uh, so this was a big cultural shift across the company. This change happened in one team, but then it, over a few years, uh, every team across Microsoft changed. Now, different divisions took a slight different, uh, slightly different approach to doing this. In some cases, like us in VSTS, when we did combined engineering, it was pure. Like, you know, we just merged the two disciplines. There is no other team that is responsible for quality. Every feature team owns its own feature area, feature area quality. So in some other orgs, they they had you know they they still left a, another small team uh, and to kind of look after the live site uh, um, telemetry or live site uh, instrumentation you know things like that. But ultimately, if you kind of fast forward now, just about all teams at Microsoft follows this model. Um, how did we how did we make this transition? I think this is uh, this is an important thing to talk about because it, it like I said it's it's a pretty drastic change. Uh, the, our first transition that I talked about where we got rid of the STE roles was very painful. 
and we have learned from that um, a lot. Uh, so when we rolled out this change, particularly in VSTS, uh, fortunately for us, there were a couple of other teams that had done this at Microsoft, so we went and talked to them. Uh, we learned from them. Uh, we had a lot of discussions in the org, uh, kind of getting the team ready to, to do this. One of the things that we were very concerned about was that you know there is all these things that the test team does. Um, some of it, what I described at the time, is dark matter. Like nobody understands what they do, but they do it, and somehow that's the magic happens, and the in uh, the right quality, um, you know, happens at the end. So we meticulously went and invented everything that the test team does. It was a spreadsheet, giant spreadsheet. I forgot how many rows, but there were rows of like. We, you know, it's not just like we run automation or we write automation. It was all the little things that the test team did to um, kind of keep track of quality in the org. And we made sure that all those responsibilities were reassigned to somebody in the org, uh, basically to, to, to these new roles. Uh, that, was, that was very key. The second thing we, we were very clear about is that this is not just changing roles and responsibility. We are going to have to change the way we test, period. Uh, if we continue to test the way we were testing before, it's not going to work in this new world. So uh, this is where uh, you know, I'll talk about the shift left testing, testing in production. Those concepts were not only internalized, but practiced uh, in the org. And we gave ourselves about 12 months to go through this transition. Now remember when we, when we did this, uh, six months later, we were uh, shipping TFS 2015. So the, the litmus test was getting the quality right for TFS 2015. Um, so we, we said we'll give ourselves about 12 months, which means in, during that time, uh, the, the SDEs and SDETs Will will start off kind of basically in their old roles, but slowly uh, evolve into doing the combined responsibilities. So you have a you may have a feature team uh, within that. The the people who are former SDETs they continue to do more of the SDETs work, and the former SDs continue to do more of the SDET, SD work. But sprint by sprint, the ratio kept changing, and eventually, you know, after six months, you cannot recognize a dev from the test uh, in the org. So that's kind of how how we managed it. Now. At the end of the transition, there were people, some people who didn't quite make the transition, and uh, you know that was that was the sad reality. But we we supported the transition through training, through sort of uh, just the development of the new skills, letting people practice, practice sprint after sprint after sprint, and so kind of just giving yourself a more practical time frame to go do this is is key. By the way, feel free to ask me questions. Otherwise, this will. Yeah, go ahead. So in this new model where everyone on the team is an engineer, and how do you take the responsibilities that were previously spread across the quality organization and delineate responsibilities on a team where theoretically everyone has the same skill set or responsibilities? I, I'm wondering how that, how the division of labor actually occurs. Because right now on, a, on the team I'm on, for instance, our test automation occurs with different engineers, and they're, they're automating the tests, but they're, and they're writing code, but they're not writing features. Right. And it's on the same team, so theoretically we're doing this too, but it seems like it's different from what you're describing too. So. Yes, it is different, and that's, uh, I think it's an important thing to clarify. In the beginning, it looked like what you just said. So think, let's take a, a particular feature team. In the old, old setup, we had five developers, maybe five testers, and that uh, constituted a feature team. We bring them together under a single engineering manager. So now that engineering man manager has 10 engineers working for him, responsible for the same area. Um, sprint one after combined engineering happened, it probably looked very similar to what you just described, that the, the, uh, the, uh, the tester was still spending most of the time developing tests. The developers were spending uh, most of the time developing uh, code and design. But the North Star was clear. The North Star was that an engineer who owns a feature owns it end to end. They can take a lot of help. They can get a lot of peer reviews of, the, of, the, of their test plans, of their design, of the, uh, their telemetry. They can get, in fact, they were encouraged to get a lot of help in terms of peer reviews. 
But the expectation was that the next sprint, guess what, they will be the one writing uh, test automation for the feature that they own. Maybe they start with a small feature that where they do that. And, and the same is true for the tester. The tester started picking up small features of the backlog and they said, we'll own these features end to end. All the way from design phase to deploying to production and, and then monitoring into production. So it started off like that and, and over time we expected devs to pick up more and more of the test responsibility and vice versa. We would flip roles at times also. And, and that's how, uh, and that's, that's why what I mean by allowing the team the 12 month uh, duration to, to, to sort of transition into this new world. Um, could you speak to a little bit about what happened to like your team's velocity, um, in particular like the development velocity, them producing uh, some business value? Did that suffer during this transition period and you guys feel like you're back to where it was? Yeah, so um, on the velocity, I, I, I don't know if Aaron showed you a chart that showed uh, sort of our feature. Um, one of the ways we measured our velocity was, velocity was just number of features delivered uh, in a, every year on average uh, per sprint. And if you look at that chart, it's, it's constant. It's been constantly uh, going up uh, since 2012, I believe you've been tracking, and now 2017. So um, the short answer to your question is no, but the feature velocity did not, did not drop. Because uh, remember, you, you still have the same number of engineers in the feature team. You just took the two separate uh, teams, you put it together. Yes, you're spending a little bit more time in terms of uh, learning and development and training uh, sort of new skills, but there was also an efficiency gain through the, this process. And that is, the key efficiency gain is that you're not handing things off to another team. When you hand things off to another team, guess what happens? This is context switch. This is like one thread waiting for the other thread to complete, and then, then it has to pick up the context and kind of run, run again. That constant back and forth that used to happen between dev and test, uh, that's gone. And so you, you gain quite, quite a lot. So in the long run, you absolutely gain velocity. You absolutely gain more capacity. In the short run, you could argue that, hey, there is, there is a, some period of training and learning. Uh, so you, so, but it's, it's, it's a good investment in just building out, the, rounding out the skills. And you'll see, uh, as I talk about in a second, the, the change was pretty uh, profound across the org. It's not just by feature team. We got rid of, uh, in fact, I can talk about that now. We, we got rid of uh, basically this notion of specialization. There, is, you, you, there are no handoffs. You don't take a feature, you write it, you design it, you give it to another person to test it, then you give it to another person to uh, deploy it. Maybe there's another person, like uh, Bill talked about, who's a branch mechanic whose job is to push uh, code around. Maybe there's another person whose job is to make sure the product is ready and it's got the uh, right performance metrics, like all this different, there's another person who's testing the deployment uh, uh, configuration testing, you know, things like that. We, we took the core principle that uh, there are no central teams, there are no specialized uh, teams that do certain tasks. Um, that, that was a core principle. But at the same time, we understood the importance of um, specialization. Specialization is important. Creating a central team where you hand things off to in a fast cadence is, is, is a problem. So we didn't want to lose specialization. So we did form a bunch of V teams. And I, I, you know, I deliberately call them V teams because these are not dedicated teams. They, uh, right now in Brands Org, there is only one team you could call that a dedicated team that does, um, uh, you know, sort of the EPS team or the team that uh, uh, runs our central engineering system. It's a small, small feature team, um, but they, again, they do core engineering work for the. Uh, they, they're contributing to the engineering system. They, nobody is handing things off to that team. Uh, so a set of V teams we formed. One of them was test architecture V team. Uh, this was a new new thing. We didn't have uh, this before. We had an architecture V team that looked after the product architecture. Uh, we didn't have anybody looking after the test architecture. And remember, we we learned that we knew that we had to change the way we test, which means we had to rebuild our test infrastructure. We had to rebuild the way um, we author tests from the ground up. So we 
we picked our senior most engineer. In fact, Bill, uh, um, you know, is a partner IC in the York, senior most IC. He said, you're going to lead this team. And he uh, had a set of other engineers from across the York, part of the V team. And this team's job was to, uh, uh, like I said, not only build the next architecture for test, but champion set of practices that we were talking about. Yes, question. Can you please explain the concept of V team? What is it? What, what oh. does it mean? Uh, v team means virtual team, so these are oh. members from different parts of the organization. Okay. It's okay. not a dedicated team reporting to a single manager. That's what I mean. Um, we had test, uh, sorry, tenant champs V team. So what are tenant champs? So these are people who are looking after the subject matter experts who are looking after some specialized activity that we do in test, whether it's uh, making sure the product is accessible, whether it's making sure product has good performance and reliability, it's, uh, it's global ready, you know, things like that. This used to be, uh, again, you know, largely be done by the, by the test team in the past. In the new world, we refactored these responsibilities. Again, every feature team is responsible for uh, making sure that their feature is accessible, is performant, is uh, global ready, but we, we would have a V team of experts from throughout the organizations whose job is to build deep expertise in this type of uh, activities, this type of work. Um, so the subject matter expertise is still valued in the orgs. The specialization is still valued in the org. The, the main difference is that it's not, uh, you know, sort of consolidated into a, a dedicated team. Uh, I mentioned performance V team. You know, this is important because when you're looking at uh, service performance or uh, product performance, oftentimes you find bottlenecks uh, in, uh, let's say you are a, uh, one of the top level feature and you're doing performance testing for work item tracking and you find uh, bottlenecks somewhere deeper in the system which is uh, owned by somebody else. So we formed a performance V team whose job was to identify common bottlenecks across the entire product and come up with the right design solutions and drive that. Uh, you know, this kind of work, you cannot just farm it out to individual feature team because the performance is an end-to-end -end, end -end problem. It's not isolated to a particular layer of the, pro of the product. A um, couple of other B teams, uh, B mod. Um, don't even ask me what the B mod stands for because I, right here at the moment I may not be able to figure that out. But it's um, B mods are the uh, uh, people who look after our uh, daily build health and the CI health, and the, the, these guys are constantly watching the builds and the runs. And if there are any failures in the uh, in them, they um, do a quick triage and assign to the appropriate owners. Uh, so we formed a BMOD team, and, and you will see that over time the, uh, uh, the size of the BMOD team also shrunk, as well as the, what we expected BMOD to do also sh shrunk as the system and the engineering system got better. Uh, finally, we retained a small vendor, vendor V team that owned some of the really hard to automate uh, uh, type of test, you know, like config test, you know, we, TFS being deployed on on-prem, different configuration environment. But again, uh, over the last three years, this team has constantly shrunk because we, every year we ask the question, why do we need so many vendors who need to do this manual testing? Let's go automate that or let's figure out a different way of uh, running those tests. So that's, that's the end of sort of what happened in terms of changing the quality ownership and, and accountability. So quick question about uh, what does it mean? Tenet. Champs V team. I don't understand the word tenant. I really didn't. Yeah, yeah, so tenant means, so performance is a tenant. Accessibility is a tenant. Or like an aspect. Well, right? Yeah, Something aspect like of the product. Yeah, okay, there you go. Got it. Yeah. An uh, attribute of the product. Yeah. yeah. Quality the, attribute. The other question was uh, I heard from uh, Scott Guthrie in a presentation some time ago the move to everything being done through the command line. Did that help in automating some of those aspects that the vendor team was? Um, uh, having to do manually? No, so vendor team is actually, uh, you know, they are, today our vendor team is doing things like uh, we have uh, TFS on-prem and can be deployed on so many different uh, configuration that we can automate that in theory. Um, it requires a significant amount of investment and, you know, for, so for things like that where 
the cost of automating uh, you know significantly more than you know kind of cost of just running it through a, a thanks Dennis, to the question so it's a, it's a matter of trade off and it, cost versus effectiveness that's right yeah. initially it was a matter of survival because remember we came from a world where you know, half the team that is basically running test and writing test to a world where suddenly that responsibility is is kind of you know distributed out to the org and so initially just uh, you know as we invented the whole um, list of things that the test team was doing and we knew that there was a good chunk of test team doing this manual testing and even then we had the vendor team uh, even test team used to retain a vendor team that would run this kind of uh, hard to automate test uh, we didn't want that to drop on the floor the key, key criteria going through this was we are shipping tfs 2015 in six months, it needs to be as good uh, quality, if not better, uh, than it was in the previous model. Not only that, we are sh you know shipping, and you know, we are continue to ship to the cloud every three weeks. So, in in going through this, the key criteria was that nothing should fall on the floor, nothing should go slip to the crack. So, even if we were doing something that was not uh, uh, optimally designed or efficient, we just continued to to run that in the new world until we figured out a way to do it better. Does it make sense? The initial thing was take whatever we have, just refactor, give it to uh, to different set of people, meaning give it to the feature team, um, but don't drop it on the floor, even if it looks questionable. Like why are we why are we running this test? It, it, it's not adding any value. Just keep running it for now until you figure out that there is there is a different way to do that. Thanks. Yeah, question. So if I understand well, these are like virtual teams. Does that seem that these people have other assignments? And if this is so, what's the ratio between their capacity in these assignments and some other things that they do? Yeah, so uh, these are the same people that we have in the feature teams. These, and, and so um, let's take uh, a specific example. Let's take accessibility. Uh, for accessibility, we have subject matter expert. Uh, by location. So in Redmond, we have two people who are sub, uh, accessibility except, uh, 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 expert, and we have another couple people in North Carolina locations, and maybe another couple people in, in India. Um, they, they are deep expert in accessibility techniques, uh, philosophy, etc. But they are engineers inside a particular feature team. They just happen to have this secondary responsibility. Accessibility happens to be one of those uh, Tenet that uh, requires quite a bit of, uh, um, if not work, but there's quite a bit of uh, responsibility on that subject matter expert. So the person who's the uh, accessibility champ uh, probably spends half their time doing accessibility and half the time uh, doing uh, feature work. But the idea is that that responsibility also over time rotates. So it's not the same person every single sprint. We may stick to the same person for a given release. So TFS 2018, there's one person, maybe TFS 2019 will try to give that responsibility to somebody else. So nobody is uh, doing this for, for life, if you will. Um, uh, and the number of experts vary by, by the tenet that we are talking about. I, performance V team, I, I think it has about a dozen people. Um, yeah, the question. So in this model, I see that uh, now individual is probably taking care of many things. Now, one who did testing had to take care of so many tenants and things. Now, as a developer, he has other responsibilities. So I imagine you manage that by maybe making smaller features and things like that. Uh, did you have any challenges with end-to-end -end coverage? Because now the, my responsibility as an individual is even smaller. And uh, how did you manage that end-to-end? -end? Were there any gaps that were unveiled by these things? Um, so if I understand your question correctly, so yes, you know, it, it appears it, on, the, on the surface it looks like your engineer is now doing twice the amount of work uh, in a feature team because you know previously you if I'm a dev I have a, a tester who's paired up with me and he's doing half the part of the uh, feature uh, uh, work or the testing work now I'm responsible for the feature but remember now I have if I'm the manager of the feature team I have twice as many you know uh, sorry I have twice as many engineers as, as I had before uh, you know so the net capacity hasn't changed net capacity is still the same net is the same but as an individual you would have given me for example a smaller feature because now 
I have to take care of my test? Or I give you more time, one of the two, right? You know, yeah. 